What's up you guys, it's Peter here and today I want to share with you another video of a Houdini battle that I did. This is the second battle that I did. This was a couple of days ago and I'll be doing a voiceover just like I did with the last one. Um, there were a few participants besides myself. We had Jake Rice, Max Mosley and Louis Crell. Uh, for commentators we had um, Remy Pierre and Justin Dykhouse and Deborah Isaac was the host, she organized it. Uh, if you want to see the quad stream, because this time we did it on Twitch, and if you want to see the quad stream, I'll link the YouTube video down below, as well as my Twitch channel for potentially future battles that you can live uh, see what's going on. So let's dig in and let's see what we came up with and what the team was. So the challenge was steampunk candy. So that's a lot of fun. It's, uh, uh, you know, you can go a lot of ways with that. So the first thing to do is to go and look up a... Um, reference. So let's dive into the scene and let's go and see what I'm up to. So basically first configure the uh, settings a little bit and then let's dive inside of it. So here's the uh, my sort of you know layout. I've got my Peter Steampunk candy kind of uh, up and uh, move it out of the way so that we have some some time or some some area where I can start working. Um, next, I'm going to start doing some reference. I need to look up some reference. Steampunk candy, what are you supposed to do with that, right? So candy is one component, steampunk the other. So first let's look at candy and let's figure out what to do with candy. Now it can go many ways. Uh, things that were popping into my mind were uh, lollipops or uh, sugar coated apples, uh, things like that. So. Um, not so much gummy bears or you know things like that, but uh, you know some of the references that I'll come up with in a moment. Well, what we're gonna see um, are along those lines. Right. So first of all, what shows up with candy, right? So we have a lot of different types of candy, and uh, that's the beauty of this kind of challenge is that you don't necessarily know which uh, which way I'm gonna go versus the other con contestants. So uh, yeah. So I like these uh, spiral-looking lollipops. I think you know they've got a really cool pattern and a fun shape. Uh, so later that spiraling is gonna come back. Not so much in the form of a lollipop, but in a handle. And then the candy apples, uh, yeah, those are classics as well. So I thought, you know, these are these are fun. Definitely something something I can do something with that. Um, now next is the steampunk side of things, and you know what I identified was there's a lot of things going on with with you know, leather and rivets and gear uh, gears I should say and pipes. So the gears definitely come back uh, when I start uh, working. Um, and also it's, it's, you know, it's, it's got this metallic look to it. So um, I was trying to figure out, okay, which elements can I use as my main element and which can be more uh, smaller scale details, right? So detailing afterwards. Because I like to build up when I, when I build my effects or when I build my uh, model, I like to build it up in layers. So I will have like a, a key component. It's almost like making a flower composition or something along those lines. You make a key, a hero flower, and then alongside you've got supporting flowers. Same kind of thing, you've got your key hero piece of candy and then alongside you're going to have all your other details. All right, so I feel like I've got enough. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the whole, uh, you know, snipping and uh, putting it into a, a mood board or a concept board, that takes too much time. I only have 45 minutes, so time is ticking. Um, so we gotta get into it. All right, so let's uh, dive into it and let's see if I drop my geometry into here. All right, so the first thing I want to do is try to figure out what can I do with an apple. So I was thinking, okay, let's let's make the outline of an apple kind of like a, a rough blocking shape. And then from there, I can add more and more details. So initially start with the rough outline and then, you know, add more and more details. So I like modeling with magnet stops and meta balls. It's, uh, I mean, the commentators were saying it's a little bit old school and I suppose it is, but at the same time, one of the big advantages of doing it this way is that you're not selecting any points, any, you know, like the, the incoming geometry can still change topology after the fact and I won't lose my selections. It's more like an influence re region, right? So I'm dealing with masks rather than, um, so meta balls are, are going to be a volumetric mask for making a selection of sorts 
um, and then the magnet stop will do the actual deformation. So here we're just moving the points down ever so slightly within that influence region. Now, once I've got one metaball and one magnet stop, I can do another one. So just alt drag out that magnet stop and make it transform so that we can move it, <clears throat> scale it a little bit and uh, we can blow it up a little bit. So here I'm going to scale this up as well as scale the, the transformation and the magnet stop so that we can uh, fatten up the apple. Now notice uh, I'm going to make a little bit of a mistake here. Uh, this, the reason why is because I'm on a tablet. So uh, I've gotten a new tablet and um, it's uh, a little sensitive when you do the, do the middle mouse button drag with the, the tablet. So, um, but no harm done. You just you know, type in the numbers on the, on the numpad and be fine as well. All right, so that basically is giving me my rough shape of my apple soon enough. And then from there, I'm going to start to think about, okay, what can I do to turn this apple shape into something more steampunky? So I'm thinking, okay, I want to create, instead of a clean apple, I'm going to create gears. I'm gonna fill up this apple shape with gears. So I'm gonna to need to make some, some cogs, some gears of a machine. And um, so initially when I thought, oh, well, I can grab this, uh, there's the order of operations again. I've got my, um, my primitives here that's gonna become important, the divisions of 25, uh, and I can select every other one of these primitives. Now, the thing is currently, I only have one primitive. It's literally one big polygon. So I'm like, oh, um, yeah, group by range right now, that's not gonna work, right? Because I don't have my, side, my sides yet. So I'm gonna need to poly extrude. I'm gonna need to give it some, some thickness. So I'm thinking, okay, let's, let's add in a poly extrude and I could have done this with a tube instead of with a circle, but um, you know, it's fine. Uh, doing it with the poly extrude will give me a side group. I cannot put the back and here we go, extrude the side. And that's gonna be really useful to basically not select the front and the back. So I'm using extrude side as my sub selection group. And then here group other allows me to select one out of two. That means every other polygon. And so we can see that over there in the viewport, the selection has been made and every other. And so now we can use that again and do a poly extrude. Now notice in the viewport that there are two polygons that are sitting close together. Now I'm gonna give it that uh, selection group, that group other. And so um, in a moment I will, uh, later on, I will come back to this and modify the, uh, the, the, the teeth of the cog or the teeth of the, 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 the gear. But for now, I'm not so concerned about that. So next, I'm going to subdivide this, but uh, this is going to subdivide rather ugly. So what I'm going to do is uh, I want to make sure that I have an inset, all right, so that we um, have a little bit of additional detail near the edges of the teeth, otherwise they're just gonna be smoothed away. So if we set the distance from, from our extrude to zero and then our inset to 0 0.06, I'm gonna have a little bit more detail. So this is good enough for my needs. I'm like, mm, should I add more detail and on the other side? But I'm like, mm -mm. Nope, I gotta move on. So next I'm going to take the subdivide and basically override crease weight. So that allows me to, you know, sort of, you know, kind of sort of uh, do at least one iteration of subdiv at without um, smoothing. So by setting my smoothing to, to two and my crease to one, I can basically specify it um, so that there is at least one level of um, creasing as well. All right, so these cogs are good enough. Um, and next I want to start mapping them to the apple. So I'm just altering the overall proportions a little bit, but now I need to figure out a way, how can I get these into the apple? So let's grab the apple again. And what I want to do is I'm going to create a line and that line will have a certain amount of points and eventually I'll copy the cogs onto the line. Now this cog is oriented in a way so that it is facing in the Z axis. So that allows me eventually when I copy these cogs onto a line that I can use the same um, orient along uh, curve. So I'm making about five points or so just for, for testing. And if we copy our cog onto the line points, then uh, we're going to have a bunch of cogs sitting on top of each other, but not in the correct orientation. So I need to fix the orientation. Easy enough. I just need to do that orient along line. So we got an orient along curve. There we go. And that gives me a normal and an up vector. And that normal is going to define how the cogs are oriented along that curve. There is sample I ultimately don't end up using, but I'm thinking here, oh, am I gonna use the, the curve view again, or am I going to try to make more details or stuff like that? But you will know, see, um, what I'm going to do now is match the size of that single curve into uh, the apple so that we basically cover 
the entire bounding box of the apple with the curve. So the curve, as we say, scale to fit, you can basically make sure that that matches. Now, the one thing is that uh, all the gears are now, okay, they're starting to stack up together. So that's, that's good. Um, I kind of want to lighten this a little bit and we'll do the uh, extrusions and all of that later. I first start with a simpler shape. So first start with a circle. If I can achieve it with a circle, then it'll work for the subdivided cogs as well. All right, so next up, I want to figure out how big should each of these cogs be. So I'm going to reproject the points of the curve onto the mesh of the apple. And we can make it so that we don't actually transform the points, but instead just do point intersection distance. And that will store a dist attribute on the points. And so when you turn off transform points, it's not gonna move them, but we do have that point intersection distance. So here, middle click, distance, the attribute is there, and I can match my P scale to that. So we can check, but then I thought, I think like, well, I don't actually want P scale because P scale is a uniform scale. So I'm gonna be using scale, which is a vector three. Um, and I can map in the X and either I'm thinking Z right now because my axis is oriented X and Z, but actually we'll see later because of the orientation along the normals, uh, I'll be, I will need to use X and Y instead. <clears throat> this has to do with the order of operations of the uh, copy shop. Anyway, so we're feeding distance in there. And so then I have that scale attribute and we can kind of look, but there's another problem that's happening. And that problem is the first and the last circle are basically completely squashed. So I'm wondering what's going on. So it must be something with the distance. And indeed, the distance of the first and the last element is basically set to zero because it's immediately snapping to one of the closest points. So we can put a clamp in between. So I'm going to grab that distance, right? And we're going to simply set it to itself, but a clamped version of itself. In order to do that, we feed it the distance first, and then I'm going to give it the minimum of the clamp value and the maximum of the clamp value. I'm going to do this using channel so that I've got sliders so that I can manually adjust this and art direct this a little bit. It's especially the minimum that, after, that I'm after. The maximum doesn't really matter. So the maximum can stay whatever it is. So the maximum is gonna become something big, but the minimum that I will need to increase from basically being zero to whatever. So see the maximum can crank that up. See, the minimum is uh, what I'm after. Now, the problem is, as I said, that we're, we're starting to deal with uh, ellipses. So here I'm, I'm kind of, it's starting to dawn on me that, hmm, wait a second, why is my uh, axis wrong? So then I'm kind of like, I'm going to swap my X and my Z axis. So again, I'm kind of looking, okay, so this circle is oriented in the, uh, in the Y and X plane. So I'm going to need to scale in the Y and X plane as well. So instead of in the, X and Z plane, where my set scale distance is, I need to modify uh, that distance so that it is in the Y and X plane. So here we go. I'm gonna swap that out. So I'm gonna set the distance to go into that uh, Y and X plane instead of the X and Z plane. Cool, and the other one is just gonna be one, so that'll stay the same scale, which is fine. Right, and so now I'm starting to get there. Good, great. So I have all of my uh, primitives. So next I can run a for loop so we can just do a for each for each primitive or for each connected primitive, it doesn't really matter. So I'm going after for each primitive. Um, so here's a funny one, uh, even though I just dropped it down, I did it so quick that I forgot uh, whether I did the right one. And I'm looking, am I doing points or pieces? Cause I'm not supposed to, I know that I need for each primitive. So the first time I actually did it correct, but I want to be hundred percent sure. So therefore that second loop, I'm gonna delete that in a moment. I don't care about it. All right, so for each of these primitives now, the extrusion is taking place, right? So I don't need that loop anymore. Um, and so each primitive is just doing the poly extrude and the subdivide and all of that. Now I'm looking at this cogs of gear and this, these gears, and it's kind of like, uh, they're all the same. So I'm going to transform them and rotate them and offset them a little bit. I'm also probably soon going to start noticing that uh, the, the teeth are a little bit ugly. So the teeth are not correct. So let's go back to that circle and set 25 to 24 and that changes that teeth, all right? So now our tooth count, our teeth count is correct, right? So we basically have every other without stacking up at the beginning and end. Also, I'm gonna add one more gear just to sort of fatten it up and close it. I don't really want any gaps because I know already right now, I already know that I want to do a flip simulation in a moment. So. Um, we're gonna be doing a flip simulation soon. Anyway, so let's build the um, transform node. So I'm gonna drop a transform sock that is going to rotate the gears randomly around the Y axis. So notice that I don't necessarily have to do every single thing with the 
orient a long curve or things, things like that. I can also do it a little bit later and break it into different pieces, which I like. Now here, this uh, metadata block that I dropped at uh, the MD1 uh, rename is simply because I'm lazy because I don't want to type the entire for each metadata one. If I just can type MD1, it's much quicker. So I can say a random, it's a detail attribute. We're going after the iterations of the metadata block. So on the detail of my metadata, we're going to grab MD and then the attribute is going to be iterations, the detail attribute. And then it's a integer, so it can just be uh, zero. So in terms of the default value, right? So the, the yeah. Anyway, and then the random returns a value between zero and one. So I'm gonna say times 360 for the amount of degrees so that it rotates randomly between zero and 360 degrees. Great, my gears are randomly offset. This is fine, it's good. Um, so next up, I want to start um, turning this into a, a VDB so that we can start thinking about doing uh, the flip fluid simulation. So I'm thinking tube in terms of what sticks out at the top, but that's going to come back later, right? So that's at the very end. I'm thinking about, you know, the handle of the candy apple. So now mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, what's steampunk? I've got my steampunk gears. Now I need the candy apple thing. So I need to convert this to VDB. So we're going to do VDB2 uh, or convert polygons to VDB. Um, also this sphere that I just dropped, that is going to become the um, emission object for my flip fluid simulation. So notice that I'm like a bit all over the place in terms of like, um, I know that I need my source and I need my collision object. So where I go from here, I'd right, convert this to VDB. Um, this is going to be, I'm basically checking over here for the polygons just to see that I don't have any gaps. Okay, great, it's good, the mesh is closed, nice. And that, is got, that also merged all the gears together in one, uh, one mesh. So this sphere over here, I'm going to transform that, put that above the uh, the gears, and that will eventually become our emission object for our flip fluid simulation. Now I will end up using a shelf button for that, and also the volume of this sphere is going to become really important because that is going to specify the amount of particles that I have. So here we've got the transform selected, flip fluid object, select the geo object outside. That's going to drop a new um, autodoc network with a flip fluid object pre-configured for me. Now I know I need candy and so on. So eventually I need viscosity, I need uh, enough particles on the surface to get a, a smooth simulation, but we'll get to that in a moment. So here from the output of the flip fluid simulation, I'm going to grab the important bits. So the import geo is important and the particle fluid surface. So everything else has to do with baking it to disk, but I won't have time to necessarily bake it to disk because 45 minute limit. So, all right, we're going to see what is gonna come out and the particle fluid surface, I'm gonna bring that back in. So here I like naming my nulls out or ref or something like that out to flip. So I know, okay, this is going to get referenced somewhere else. Also, now I'm going to turn that collision object so that it can go as well, ref collision or something like that, ref collider. Yeah, there we go. And so that ref collider is going to need to be added to the flip fluid simulation. And already I can see, okay, I've got a bunch of particles there, um, but let's, make sure that it picks up the right thing. So the initial data over here needs to point to my uh, out to, to flip, not my collider, but out to flip. Yeah, there we go. And so that will pick up the correct SOP data. So there are a couple of points there, but my um, particle separation needs to just be a little bit smaller. So I've got more points. Now, this is where things can get really slow. So I gotta be careful. Uh, my sphere is maybe not too big yet, but we'll see. Uh, I may need to change that particle separation. So I'll, eventually I'll see some multipliers come on, on that particle separation. So things will run a little bit faster in the flip fluid simulation. All right, anyway, we've added the uh, static object to that. So I'm going to check with the static object that my uh, collision geometry is good. So hook it up to the flip simulation, make sure that it's not mutual, it's, the collision is left to right. So it's just a one-way stream. And then the geo here. So here I'm isolating the collision geometry and we're literally checking the SDF for the flip fluid simulation is gonna be good enough. So I need more detail. So we're basically lowering the, uh, the size a little bit. And then let's run the flip fluid simulation. So now we can check, right? I mean, as we kind of run the gravity and all that, um, but I know I will eventually, so I need my, my viscosity. And here, particle separation times three, this is what I was saying, I wanna start running this a lot quicker. I'm looking at the wrong thing, gotta make sure my gravity is enabled, my output is good. All right, this is good. Uh, so my sim is running. So now I know, okay, we can kind of make this run a little bit faster by setting this times five, and I need just more particles. So that means the initial source volume needs to get bigger. 
So I'm going to scale up my sphere. So we're looking at the collider. I don't need the collider. I need the source. So there on that sphere, right, this is where the scale can get a little bit bigger. And eventually I will need to elongate it. I'm going to scale it in the Y axis so that we can make a long tube like uh, volume. And then it's going to be filled with particles and it's going to start streaming down. But obviously, because the gravity is really strong, it's going to fall pretty, pretty quickly. So in a moment, we're going to need to modify the gravity. But in essence, considering how fast this is running, good, it's doing or it's starting to do at least what I want. So here we go. I'm looking for the um, potentially the surface oversampling that's later uh, so that we can get smooth surface detail. But also here we're adding the viscosity attribute, right? And in the physical settings, I'm going to add viscosity. So viscosity is one of those that goes from zero to like 100,000. So it's, it's the values are just huge in terms of the range. So I tried 20 and I don't think I touched it anymore. So when we open it up on the flip solver, we can see viscosity is there. There is viscosity by attribute, but I don't need it because the viscosity of the entire particle sim is the same. I don't need relative per particle viscosity. So, all right, it's enabled. Uh, that makes it run a little slower. And here I want to set my gravity lower so that the amount of force as these particles are going down is just reduced. So that means that there's actually more importance already going to be given to the viscosity and it's starting to get that kind of, you know, uh, honey-like behavior where it kind of flows off. Now, the problem is that what I'm struggling with here is that ultimately uh, it is still not sticking so much. So with the surface tension, I'm trying to make sure the particles try to stick closer together, which is going to hopefully reduce a little bit of that uh, diverging velocity that comes from the collision between the particle and the gear and makes them kind of flow to the outside. So it's a little bit better, but not that much. And unfortunately, um, I didn't have enough time to kind of keep resimming and resimming to find the right setting so that it really slowly kind of runs over this. Because this is supposed to be caramel and, and like, you know, that's not really like water. Um, so even though there is a bit of that viscosity in there, maybe I need more viscosity, maybe I needed uh, more surface tension or make a custom force, which is like a VDB, where I can kind of uh, have the particles almost stick closer to the surface, things like that. So I'm kind of remodeling my uh, so source over here and uh, redoing my, my mesh, but I, I'm uh, redoing my sim, but I'm aware I need to move on, right? So the time is ticking. So I really can't spend much more time to this. So I'm kind of like uh, getting a little bit frustrated waiting at this point. Um, I'm, uh, I'm on the clock and I know that, uh, you know, the more time I spend on the sim, the more I kind of uh, lose time on other things. So this was a calculated risk. I was thinking, oh, should I use a pop speed limit? Um, eventually, I, I think I did use it, but only for the, um, I'm, I'm putting a expression in there. So only for the first, uh, I don't know, 50 or 80 frames or so. So with the maximum speed we can set here, I like using the presets because I can see which parameters that I can modify. So with speed max, that's the one that I want. I make a mistake here and say spin max, but we'll correct for that in a moment. Um, and so I'm going to do a little if statement, uh, just, just checking for now what, what happens if it's a spin max of 10 or whatever. Uh, I know my gravity is uh, negative nine, so I know gravity is about negative nine in terms of force. And so here we can say if the frame is less than 50, then uh, going and limit the speed tremendously. So that will try to make sure that the gravity has very limited effect because obviously gravity is an additive force. It basically gets added and added and added. So we're getting more and more and more downwards force. I need some downwards force, but not too much. All right. So I'm going to say basically when the particles are greater than um, 50 or rather than the timeline is greater than 50, then uh, it can do whatever it needs to do. So then my spin max or uh, whatever. So here we're, we're going to get speed max instead of spin max. And I'm going to replace spin max with speed max, the correct attribute, and then uh, also modify it so that speed max is um, value of 10 when the timeline is greater than 50. All right, let's run it again. Let's check it. All right. And so now there is a maximum uh, speed limit on these particles. So they can't really, it's kind of like a, a fake viscosity, right? I'm really trying to shape my fluid sim here just so that they really don't flow too far, too far outwards, right? And so it's starting to work, uh, but I'm also seeing we're already at frame 87 and the particles are still flowing. So I'm going to modify my frame less than 50 to something like less than 80. All right. So as we kind of uh, run this through, this seems like it's good enough. So let's rewind the sim, let's run it again. And now I need to move forward. So basically this is going to be pretty much the last one that I run, maybe with more particles, maybe with some um, 
some surface receding, surface oversampling, just to get like really smooth results. But overall, I need to move forward. I can't spend more time on this because otherwise I've, I've got the gears and one sim and it's not gonna be good enough. I need other elements, right? So I basically, so here we go, particle separation to four, just, you know, like a little bit uh, more particles, but not too many. Particle motion, here we go, surface oversampling. So I'm gonna get a lot more particles at the surface times 10. Uh, that turns out to be too slow. So uh, I'm kind of like looking at my sim and it's kind of like, oh God, it's so slow, chug, chug, chug. I'm waiting for it. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty slow. Um, so I don't wanna wait for that. So I'm gonna set my surface sampling a little bit lower. Now the surface oversampling, what that does is that scatters additional particles just in the surface area, like near the surface of the liquid, um, where the VDB, because underneath it, there's a surface VDB, this is flip, so the particles and the, there's a grid here. And so uh, the SDF that is calculated underneath it, where uh, the SDF is close to zero, that's where more particles are going to get scattered every single frame. So by doing that, we can have more particles at the surface and therefore get a very, very nice smooth particle fluid sampling solution. So a, flu a smooth mesh out of this. So here we're gonna time shift this because I only really need one frame. So we're gonna let this play a little bit more and then I'm going to pick, I don't know, frame 150 or 180 or whatever frame I, I eventually settle on. Um, and that is the particle geometry that I'm just gonna have to work with from that moment on. Uh, now, in the sphere here is templated. That's just, that was left over. I don't know where I left that templated, but really I'm looking at the collision geometry with the gears, right? That's what I really care about. So in a moment, we'll, we're gonna bring in the gears, we're gonna bring in the particle fluid surface mesh, and then uh, merge them together so that we can see both elements together. All right, so now I'm really getting fed up in terms of like, I'm, I'm, in the meantime, like whilst my sim is running, I'm like, well, let me look at my reference again, just sort of see, because might as well, right? Do, do parallel use of your time, so. All right, so it's almost there. I'm almost, you know, I'm kind of like, okay, I'm liking it. There's some, uh, some tenderly looking bits kind of going over the edge. Um, but here's the thing, I'm looking at it in isolation. I'm not looking at it with the collision object. So I'm currently not seeing how far away that is uh, from the gears. So anyway, I've broken the time shift with the uh, control shift click on the frame. And so I've, I'm basically just recording frame 165. Now I want to stash that geometry. So that's kind of like locking your node. This is uh, not recommended when you're doing it in production. This is in the, in the sense that what this will do is it'll store the geometry in your scene file. But the reason for doing it here is that I do not want to resim because I'm going to waste time otherwise. And I also don't want to write to disk. So the stash is like, all right, store this data temporarily in this node. There we go. And so that, that is gonna store, I don't know, another, an additional 10 megabytes to your hip file. So you don't wanna necessarily do that normally, but here it's okay. We're literally just modeling one single frame, so it's fine. So let's go and look, hook up the particle fluid surfacer and have a look at uh, the resulting mesh. So when I look at both of them combined, then I kind of start to realize like, oh, there's quite a bit of a difference between the cogs and the fluid. So here I'm trying to grab my particles and I'm going to ray them onto my cogs. But the problem is uh, it should really be more of an, an average sort of squeezing of the particles, especially at the bottom, rather than a hard um, array project using the minimum, uh, minimum distance. So with the blend shape, I can do a percentage blend so that it's not a full you know, scatter, but it's sort of more of a blend between the ray that is going to do minimum distance projection and my particles that are sort of you know, where they were simmed. But as you can see, there are some holes in there and that's gonna cause some problems. Even though you know, the, the particles are starting to get closer to the mesh, so it's kind of sort of starting to do what it needs to do, but not 100% what I'm after. So I'm kind of like, uh, this isn't really working for me. So I'm, I'm going to uh, need to do something else. So I'm kind of like, well, you know, it's kind of broken up. See, it's got these kind of uh, different islands of particles. So I'm like, mm, this isn't working. I'm gonna have to bypass that and just go with what I've got. And then maybe afterwards uh, here, this is what I would have done with the mesh, right? Maybe put a, um, a, a, a point lattice on it. So I use a point deform and uh, squeeze the bottom polygons together a little bit more, do something along those lines. Um, but no more time. So I'm going to see if I can do it with fluid filtering a little bit and set my particle separation ever so slightly a little bit smaller to sort of thin it out. Um, we could do some more filtering, but I, again, wanted to move forward. So I didn't want to spend too much more time on the meshing portion of the fluids. 
So all right, let's say well, we're sort of happy with this. So next I'm kind of like, okay, I've got to move on. So uh, I believe um, I'm trying to figure out, right? So, so what is the best way to move forward from this? And so here I'm thinking, okay, I can definitely use some of the particles that I have from our particle simulation and um, make a sub-selection of them so that we can use maybe, I don't know, even 1% of those particles to scatter some of my cogs on there again. So that's what we're doing now. So it's kind of like a little back and forth where I'm basically figuring out what my next step is. How can I kind of make this better? How can I either solve my fluid problem, but that's that train is, you know, that, that, that train has left, that, that chip is gone. So I basically, uh, I'm going to grab a, a portion of my uh, particles in a moment. But first, I, let's add some alpha to it so that I can see through my mesh, right? So alpha of 0 0.3 is going to allow me to see through my mesh and uh, see the, the cogs underneath it, because otherwise my uh, sort of fluid simulation is completely going to cover my cogs, and that's not the goal. I want to make sure that there's a little bit of, oh, there's more to this than just a fluid simulation. Now I have that uh, apple in my mind, right? So this is going to be like a red color, somewhat red. And so when we look at it together, I can kind of start to see, okay, great, this is this is starting to work, right? My, my fluid is kind of flowing over my gears, it's, it's fine. Um, cool. So next I want to use an attribute wrangle and make that sub-selection um, of, uh, of my particles. Now initially it's like group expression, uh, group expression, don't like it as much. I like wrangles better because I can do my selection and my deletion in, in one go. Don't need a particle fluid surfacer, but here we're going to select the particles. And here we're going to say, okay, make a random based off of the point number. And if that random value is greater than a certain threshold, which I set, uh, then go and delete it. So here, if this is greater than channel some threshold, some value that I can specify, then go and delete that particle. So we're going to remove point. Uh, normally, if we're doing this rand at PT num, I would rather use rand at ID uh, because it's with particles and the IDs are stable, the point numbers are not. But again, single frame, right? So it's baked, it shouldn't change anymore. And I don't really care about every single individual particle. So anyway, remove point from the current geometry is zero, which point at PT num. And so here I'm selecting just ever so slightly, maybe like 1% of the points. Great. And so these points are even less than that, 0 0.01. So these points are going to become gears of their own. But my gears are somewhat heavy in the sense that they have all this subdivide data on them. So I kind of want to branch off from my original gear so that I can use that to scatter and copy on that again. So let's bring that down. Let's use a copy sub once more. And I want to say mm, the subdivide might need to lighten the load a little bit and take at least one subdivision off of that because these this geometry is going to get heavy. Now, another good idea would be with, with these kind of particles is to use packing and instancing. Um, I don't think I, I over here, I don't think I end up packing and instancing. Uh, I'm starting to add some color to it because I'm like, okay, the gear should be sort of metallic and, and yellowish. Uh, and then my particles will be, uh, the gears of the particles will have all kinds of colors. So here I'm starting to realize, mm, okay, I've got my copy to points it's working, but uh, it's kind of heavy. So I need to randomize also my normals. These are kind of all pointing just along the velocity. So here we go. The velocity goes depth to one. So a little bit less polygons at least. So I can work a little bit quicker. So what I see in my viewport is a little bit faster. So random P scale, great. That's the first start. I want a random value between 0 0.3 and one. And we're gonna go a little bit smaller as well. So here is 0.3. So that at least 30% to 100% of the scale. That's what I like doing. Um, I don't like, it's, it's meaningless to have gears that have a scale of zero. So, or even a scale of 0.1, it's too small. The, the, user, the, the viewer would never see that. All right, so then an orient quaternion. So I need a direction or orientation. This needs to be a vector four. So there we go, dimensions to four. So now we have random orientations on it. And lastly, I want the colors, right? So, and the reason why I do the colors is, uh, for visual purposes. I mean, I, I am an artist at heart and I want it to look pretty. I mean, that, that gives me audience bonus points. I know that if it's just all gray, it's gonna be kind of boring. So I definitely will need colors. So if we just randomize the color values, uh, I'm going to get some, some nice sort of uh, candy looking kind of punk style uh, little bits of candy scattered into my um, fluid simulation. Now let's merge everything together and let's watch it all together. So now I can kind of judge it against the scale of the uh, of the entire thing. And so uh, maybe, okay, let's fatten up the alpha a little bit so that we can kind of, uh, it becomes a little bit more opaque. Uh, maybe change that a little bit more eventually. 
Um, and now I'm kind of starting to think, okay, um, I'm gonna make this the, the scale a little small. So just tweaking a little bit at this point, maybe have some more of these, uh, you know, these uh, gears. So I keep a little bit more of my uh, remove point. This is the beauty of Houdini. You can just go back in your network and just start tweaking all the values that you want. But again, I can't keep tweaking too much. So now I'm like, I'm gonna move on. And I want to start building the stick that sticks out at the top. Remember, we kind of need something to stick out at the top. And so this is where uh, my mind is going towards that uh, swirled candy lollipop kind of thing. So I want to start having not just one tube, but eventually two tubes. But I start with one tube because, you know, we can easily branch off later. And then I'm going to need to bend it and twist it and give it those typical uh, red and white swirly colors. Um, so, all right. I like breaking out my transforms into separate transforms so that uh, I can leave my original tube pretty much as is and just turn on and off. The reason why those transforms are there is because I can turn on, I can bypass those transforms and see the different behaviors. And I can also uh, refer back to how this one is gonna be the length of the, the tube, this one is gonna be the rotation or orientation of the tube and so on. So here we go, into the bend. And so I have enough uh, subdivisions there. So this is where I start struggling with the new bend a little bit. I haven't really used it enough. And I'm like, okay, okay, it's, it's bending, so it's kind of working. But what, the most important part I'm missing here, I'm trying to figure out which is my up vector, which is, which is the direction, where can I choose the direction? And the direction is actually at the bottom under the capture section. So it's gonna take me a little bit of time to figure out that currently it's capturing in the Z axis and I need to capture in the Y axis instead because that's the, the key direction of my orientation. So um, I'm like, oh crap, whatever. I, I did too many things wrong, right? So I, I messed up the defaults. So it's quicker to just delete the node and start over, right? I, I wanna try it again and really like look at what it is doing. And then I'm like, okay, set capture region. Oh, I found, okay, capture region, but in the viewport. I don't wanna capture in the viewport. So I'm getting closer that it's not, you know, it's not the direction either. That's not what I need. I need to, to set eventually the capture direction. So. It's kind of funny to see myself struggle right now because now I, I definitely don't uh, forget anymore that I need to set the capture region first and then. So here we go, um, making the, the scale to 10. And this is kind of nice because this will allow me to sort of figure out maybe um, instead of a long unit length. So I'm still realizing, okay, it's still in the wrong axis. Why is this axis not working? I wanna check all the axes. Um, so, but, but still the wrong direction. So eventually I'll, I'll finally figure it out. Oh, okay, there it is, capture length. Okay, so, ah, oh, there it is, capture direction. That's the one. And I'm so happy. I'm like, at this point, I'm like, yay, this is great. Finally, finally worked. Like, I mean, seriously, internally, I'm really overjoyed right now that I figured out how that bend node works. All right, so, you know, we can make it certain lengths. Okay, 20 is long enough, can deal with that. And then, um, I'm going to need to twist it, right? So now I'm like thinking bend, but instead of copying this bend, I'm going to just delete that or ignore that because I want to I want to twist it first. And so it's sometimes it's just easier to start from scratch with this. So instead of one, I want to have two. So I know that these candies tend to be made with two rolls of you know, sugar rolls or whatever, and one is going to be red and one other is white. Currently I'm hard coding it, it's positive 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5, but eventually we'll make this as relative references with those transforms, so that if I modify one, we'll modify both. So anyway, this is going to go into my bend, and we're going to change this into a twist. I'm going to drop a new bend because I don't want to pollute any settings or carry any of the bend settings. So I need to go to twist, I don't want any bend, so we're going to first do that capture region, see now I know. <laughs> I know that my capture region needs to be, uh, you know, the length as well. There we go. All right, so now it's, it's long enough. Great. And so as long as it just covers, right? Now we need something like 360 or 180 times X amount. So 360 times 10. So I've got 10 full rotations going on here. Um, and then we can modify it so that I have more subdivisions in my tube so that we've got enough detail to make sure that my twisting and then later my bending will hold up. So here we go, copy reference hook that up negative from the other one so that they are already in the same direction. So if I modify one, the other one will follow. This is literally just not me being lazy, but I would say me being a bit more efficient with it so that if I modify one, the other one is like a mirror image of it. Now for color sakes, this is where it's gonna be nice for me to sort of debug a little bit. So, you know, and at the same time define my final color. So that white and red, that is so typical of those kind of candy canes um, is coming in over here as well. So now uh, as I zoom out, I'm kind of like, okay, this is gonna work. Nice, right? I'm happy again. It's like both the twist and the bend 
working with that capture region. The next thing that I'm trying to do is I'm going to see what does it all look together, first of all, and then that's to figure out my scale and my proportion, right, so that everything sort of works. Uh, so it looks like these are, are, you know, maybe they're a little bit too fat, we'll see. Um, but also, so I'm gonna, yeah, I'm definitely gonna thin out that uh, scale value, I think, eventually. Let's see. Um, yeah, I'm looking at where my scale is for my, my tubes, but I've got to be careful because if I do the uniform scale, right, yeah, then everything gets messed up. So I instead want to scale um, more in one the axis maybe. So i um, kind of figuring out, okay, I'm going to need to put a new transform in there. So I'm going to move that out of the way and put a new transform so that it only scales in the in, in, the, in two axes rather than three axes. Don't want uniform scale. All right, just put in the transform. There we go, transform and that will allow me to scale only in those two axes so in the x axis and in the z axis there we go so now i've got like nice and thin little candies and so i've got to modify this too and i'm realizing oh actually you can just use that 0.5 and uh use only a quarter of that so notice that i value 0.27 right so that's 0.5 times 0.5 times once more 0.5 so that's a quarter and so by doing that, it, it now my thing, if I modify it, it automatically adjusts, right? So I like working with tubes that are starting in unit length so that I can do my scaling operations against unit length. So next I'm trying to figure out how can I make it so that my lollipop is going to, or rather that stick is going to be maybe turned into a lollipop. So it's like it, it turns like a, a, a nice circle around and around and around. And I know I've seen it somewhere in the, uh, in the Houdini videos that you can kind of make it with an offset so that it, it rotates, um, but it doesn't rotate 360 degrees. It kind of, you know, there's a little offset to that, but I'm missing exactly where that is. So it's, I still don't quite know how to do that. There's probably uh, something with the capture origin that I need to offset a little bit more. Like, I feel like I'm close here, right? But I couldn't quite get it. Maybe it's in the wrong axis. Maybe it's something else. I don't know what it is, but, um, or maybe, yeah, I, I still don't know where it is. So we're gonna have to see maybe, uh, the attribute needs to change over over the life you know the amount of band needs to change over the over the capture regions things like that so um yeah but i don't know where to do that so whatever gotta move on and gotta revert back to what i had before which was you know it was good it was okay it wasn't great but i mean it's it's okay right i mean it's uh, it's better than not having it all right, so got some rotations, got uh, everything. So now I'm kind of starting to think, okay, what else can I add to this, right? So I'm starting to run out of time as well. We're, you know, a good, um, you know, a good 40 minutes in or something like that. So I'm going to start thinking, okay, maybe I'll make it a little bit shorter, maybe a little bit longer. You know, now I'm thinking about proportions. So <clears throat> I started to tweak it. So next I'm thinking, okay, I've got, you know, I've got big elements, well, smaller elements, now I need micro details. So we're going to start detailing the entire thing. Also, I'm still looking at that bottom, still don't really like that bottom. But at the same time, if you look at it from the side, you can't really see it, right? So here we're going to modify the alpha even more so that I'm hiding the gears a little bit more. And it really starts to look like a piece of candy now with like, you know, little gears inside and then um, my semi-transparent uh, fluid on top. All right, I've got, I'm, I'm asking about time right now, I believe. I'm checking time soon um, with the, uh, the commentators and um, uh, I'm, I'm going to just basically uh, add a little bit more um, particles on the top. So I'm thinking sugar, right? So, so sprinkle some sugar on top. So how can we do that? Well, I'm going to try and extract out the top polygons out of the flip fluid mesh. And uh, using the normals over here, we can just select that. Now, the thing is that the flip fluid mesh, as it comes out, is is a, a, um, a poly soup. And you can't do that with a poly soup. So I will eventually need to convert first to polygons. Also, currently, I've also selected uh, all of the gears. So I've got the wrong input co coming in. So we're going to modify it so that we select only the flip fluid. And we can say group top or something like that. Yeah. And extract out uh, the top. So we can blast every polygon except for the top group top and delete non selected on that. So now I've got all my top and this we can use to scatter, but this immediately shows me, oh yeah, this is wrong. The input is coming from the wrong thing. So I need it from the particles fluid surfacer. So let's go grab that input from the particle fluid surfacer and let's blast everything. Why is it not working? Middle click, I'm seeing, I just saw, oh, it's a poly soup. That was all I needed, right? Um, so with the convert, I can convert this to polygons. And then with the, once it's polygons, I can do my selection using my group 
using the normal. So that now is working. So I can scatter my points on there. And uh, so now I'll have sort of a bias towards the top. It's kind of like a dot product operation under the hood. So here, iterations to one, I, I don't like the full, you know, super relaxed look for things that are supposed to be somewhat semi semi uh, random scatters. So here I can copy my gears, all of it again, and just update it so that my scatter is coming uh, from my uh, scattered points instead of from my flip fluid simulation. Just modify the scale a little bit, 0 0.3, just make it you know, three times or a third of what the original scales were, because these are, so, these are supposed to be micro elements, right? So now we're dealing with really small scale detail. And so that's how I like to layer it up. Now, the other thing is this micro detail needs to distinguish itself a little bit more. So that means I'm gonna change the color so that it's more of a pastel-like palette. Instead of this harder, random, red, green, blue colors, I'm going to make it sort of, you know, a soft yellow or a soft, um, um, soft pink or so. So I'm looking at the uh, at the top and it's, you know, now it's hard red, but uh, what if it's yellow? Okay, still not really what I'm looking for. So I'm gonna change this a little bit more and then um, we're going to turn this into more of a white sugarish kind of color. So now I'm talking to the uh, moderators and asking about uh, what's the time, you know, just checking, making sure I'm pretty much there. Um, so let's see. Next, I'm going to say, okay, well, I don't really have much more time to add anything new to the scene, except for maybe beautification. So what does that mean? Lights. I need to add some lights to the scene and also maybe a camera so that I can always have the same view for it. Um, and then uh, eventually, you know, fill lights, all, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, just clean it up a little bit. Trying to figure out a little bit what my time is, right? My time, my alarm went off. So basically I'm, uh, I'm checking because maybe my alarm went off a little bit sooner. I set it to like 44 minutes or something like that, but I had an additional four minutes left. So maybe I made a mistake. Anyway, so I can keep going and just modify it. So, you know, that, that's, there's that pinkish color. So, okay, now it's kind of looking like uh, sugary uh, pink colors, whatever. So good, happy with that. So the only thing is it looks like the subdivide might be still a bit high, but I don't think I'm changing it anymore. So, so when I set this to 10,000, I'm like, uh oh, this is getting really heavy. So maybe not, let's go back <laughs> too many points. That's by the way, that by scattering so many, uh, that's how uh, Louis crashed his file. Uh, you know, he sc scattered like his entire cupcake he was doing, uh, I don't know, a lot of times on a spiral and that's how he crashed. So for me, scattering and copying can definitely create a lot of geo, so better be, be careful with that. So here using the lab's turntable, I was like, well, I know that node exists, so I haven't really used it much, but it's already pre-configured, great, looks fine, nice. I'm like, <laughs> this saves time from me doing the transform. Uh, the transform here is just to move it so that it sits on the ground plane. I like to sort of make my objects sit on the ground plane. Um, all right, now it's intersecting with my uh, my 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 name and the uh, steampunk candy sort of font. So I'm going to go in that. Also, let's add some spotlights and some so, so a key light first of all. And uh, I'm going to modify the settings here so that it's uh, ever so slightly, maybe eventually like yellowish. And so now let's add a fill light from the other side. And this is going to be 0 0.3 in terms of its intensity and also sort of more of a bluish hue. Notice this is all beautification. I'm pretty much done at this point, right? I don't want to continue modeling. I literally, this is presentation, but presentation is important, right? To, to you know, present a work is important. Um, so here we go. Like just added a little bit of that sunlight color, you know, just slightly yellow, oranges, orangey color to it. And then also I need to have a camera so that when I look through it, my scene, I can always see it through the same kind of look. So let's make a new camera. I'm kind of, you know, trying to find my shot. All right, and let's move the uh, let's move the font out of the way because it's kind of you know, in the way right now. So here, I'm just gonna break it apart a little bit. So it's steampunk candy, and let's move it to the side. So here, just move it to the side. I know that my uh, my other one is sort of sitting there. My my piece of candy is sitting in the middle. So okay, great. Cool, so now I'm happy with this. So I'm gonna start seeing if I can run a little flipbook with um, my uh, thing. So I'm uh, with my, you know, my work. Um, I'm gonna dive inside of my geometry object just so that we can kind of see it. Or maybe just find a nice frame as well. Kind of looking like, it's nice to see with the illumination on it, right? So you can kind of see how the highlights are working as well. Uh, definitely a nice way to present, right? So because the highlights will, uh, indicate how the shape is of the of the piece of candy. 
and it's that sort of semi-transparent look that makes it look a little more complex so yeah the alpha as well 0 0.7 i want to indicate that there is more to it than meets the eye right and i mean there is so we have a nice kind of rotating thing so cool um next i think i'm going to flip book it and then we are pretty much done for this one so there we go flip book the thing and there we go so it's going to start flip booking i'm like all right great we're pretty much done uh i think time got called as well around this time so uh this is pretty much the end of it so this is pretty much the end of the contest um and so it's running so yeah this was it this was about 45 minutes worth of uh you know, challenge, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, I believe, let's see if I remember, uh, Jake made some kind of squashed candy, like those uh, those mints, those uh, red and white mints, you know, some interesting patterns with that. And then um, Louis made a cupcake, uh, and uh, that was also kind of cool, with some gear sticking out of it. And then um, Max made... Uh, also a lollipop, but uh, had some really interesting bits with uh, Roman symbols, uh, Roman numerals, uh, and also an L system that he used, and some uh, paneling for more abstract panels in there. Uh, definitely with some pretty cool stuff. A bit more abstract, but yeah, fun stuff. And it's, it's really fun to see everyone's work together. Uh, so anyway, when this, uh, whilst this is running, the only reason, or the only weird thing that I'm thinking now, I mean, I'm looking at the other contestants whilst they're going over it, is why is my flipbook running so slow? So I'm thinking, um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if I'm looking at it now, it's, I turn off my simulation, so it can't be the sim. So I'm not 100% sure why it's so slow. It might be something to do with the copying or something. I don't no clue, but it should not be running this slow because I can literally scrub it in the viewport. Uh, so yeah, something strange going on. Anyway, we'll wait a little bit. And um, in the meantime, also uh, everyone is presenting their work. So, you know, they're presenting, I'm gonna be presenting my work. They are presenting their work. I really like this stuff. This is fun, right? I mean, seeing how different people interpreted this. Um, I'd highly recommend if ever you have a chance to participate in one of these Houdini battles, please do it. It's fun. It's a fun community thing and sharing with other people how you do stuff. Totally fun. Um, yeah, so anyway, whilst this flipbook is going, uh, hopefully it finishes soon, um, we're looking at the other people's work, right? And I'd highly recommend check out the uh, YouTube stream or, or rather the YouTube video from the, the quad stream on Twitch uh, that was recorded. And also, if you like this kind of video, you know, please like and subscribe to my channel and to uh, Houdini School channel as well, where the uh, battles, the quad streams and the commentators are uh, going to be uh, uploaded to. Um, yeah, and then again, if you, uh, if you ever want to participate in this, uh, you know, please try it as well. Uh, it's, it's great fun. It's a lot of fun. Alrighty, so there's my uh, steampunk candy result. All right, guys, um, I hope you enjoyed this. And um, if you do, you know, please like and subscribe and see you in the next video. All righty, bye-bye.